Today I will speak on um, Danga Chatelhuyuk. Um, and I will read a shortened version of a paper that um, will be published in the coming months. So, trampled, discarded, stockpiled, buried, burnt, or mixed with other materials, at times objected, at times highly sought after. Dung endures at the core of material culture present and past. While archaeological writing highlights various forms of human action in relation to it, Dung's material vitality remains unaddressed. By drawing on the work of Jane Bennett and Karen Barrett, I explore Dunga Chattelhuk as a vital matter and discuss it as an ontologically multiple substance emerging from complex interactions between bodies, matter, and places of all sorts. In the process, Dung becomes a companion in thinking sociality, politics, ethics, and the history of dwelling in more inclusive and plural ways. Since the Neolithic, Dung has been entangled with dwelling. As refuse, manure, construction material and fuel, it has acted as a means or impediment to human action associated with various aspects of everyday life. Archaeologists approach its ubiquitous presence in the material record through categories of context, resource and constraint. Various scientific techniques employ animal waste and its proxy markers in the study of past environments and the structuring of dwelling places and waste management strategies. Dung analyses are also integrated into studies of herding and cultivation techniques and various technologies of making. Despite drawing on dung's chemical, physical, biological and mechanical properties, that is, its materiality with capacity to act and produce a number of distinct effects, Archaeological narratives concerned with dung and the social seldom attend to the force of its material vitality. As a result, archaeological accounts pursue dung's material trails to regularly arrive at binary-based interpretations built on the distinction between animate-inanimate, natural-cultural, human-non-human, and clean-unclean. This paper, however, flashes out an alternative approach, one that focuses focuses on dung as a flow, a process, and in Tim Ingold's words, a correspondence with the material. In the course of my paper, I examine how dung enacted its distinct corporeal force at Chatelhug and discuss ways in which its vitality was co-shaped and co-produced by many different social, biological, physical and chemical processes, some of which existed independently of people yet could nevertheless significantly affect them. By focusing on its distinct relational properties and material engagements, I examine a number of different more than human communities associated with Dung's materiality. When examining Dung in relation to time and dwelling places, I contend that its spatial and temporal boundaries were not discrete but porous and fluid. The matter was in a constant state of flux, a continuous process of becoming. This argument is incrementally developed across three sections of the paper. In the first, I briefly outline some of the new materialist perspectives and ways in which they can be fruitfully applied to archaeologies of materials. The second applies a diffractive method to examine the geoarchaeological data from various depositional contexts to Chatelhuyuk. My aim is to illuminate Danke Chatelhuyuk as an ontologically multiple substance emerging within distinct spatial-temporal configurations. In my conclusion, I address issues of ethics and politics by comparing and contrasting Dung as it once was and as it is today. Vital materialism approaches ecology as an intimate and involved sociality, and sociality is an intimate and involved ecology. The two are merged within material assemblages wherein vitality saturates animate and inanimate alike. In these multivocal collectives, animals, plants, microorganisms, things and materials, in fact all permutations of matter and energy, possess a capacity to act or to affect the direction of processes and events and to play a substantive part in their outcomes. Some operators in complex and volatile clusters coexist, cohabit and cooperate, whereas others are in conflict with each other and cause or undergo friction. While interacting with each other, these different animate and non-animate, human and non-human materialities, exert multiple forces that create distinct emergent properties of the whole.
Jane Bennett's description of the failure of the electrical power grid, the vital, vital undercurrent of modern day life, provides one of the most powerful and evocative examples of such multiple material agencies distributed across a range of human and non-human bodies. Rather than a consequence of exclusively human decisions and emissions, Bennett forcefully argues that the Northeast blackout of 2003 culminated in the devastating paralysis of the lives of 15 million people across North America as an effect of a distribu distributive agency spread across a volatile assemblage of power plants, active and inactive transmission wires, electron streams, particular wildfire, computer software with a bug, deregulatory legislation on energy trading, distinct lifestyles, relentless consumerism and corporate greed. The complex mesh of matter and energy in the malfunctioning grid clearly demonstrates some of the ways in which human intentions and actions are not necessarily the pivotal performers. Moreover, it also highlights the need for a radical rethink of causality, change, ethics and politics. In Meeting the Universe halfway, Karen Barrett offers arguably one of the boldest and most ro robust frameworks for theorizing all of this through mattering. To attend to the world through mattering is to emphasize matter's animacy and its performative nature. Matter acts, creates, collaborates, vitalizes, rebels, transforms, destroys. It is less of a thing, more of a process. Going a step further, Barra dismisses not only the notion of agency as a property of distinct human and non-human bodies, but also notably the very notion of discrete entities. Nothing exists independently, Everything emerges through the entanglement and responsibility. Sig significantly, this interaction or the process of co-constitution also requires a new way of thinking causality. Contrary to the traditional view in which cause-effect dynamics are explained by effect following cause, change is no longer examined in terms of what causes what, but of what coexists with what. Given that people and the environment are co-constituted and that substances such as dung, waste, clay and plastic are an important part of this phenomena, tracing the various material entanglements between humans and non-humans through the archaeological record can help us to rediscover materials and at the same time develop and enhance sensibility to their vitality in the past, present and future. In the next part of the paper, I shall then examine the ebbs and flows of the practices and processes associated with dung by taking a closer look at the liveways of one mud brick settlement perched on a lower rubble mound rising across 7th millennium BC from a marl hollow within an undulating and ecologically diverse Karshamba rivering plain, a settlement called Chatal Hoog. In the long-lived, tightly knit and egalitarian house society of Chatel Hoog, dung was not unlike clay, a um, mundane and widespread material, excreted in situ within panning areas throughout the settlement or brought onto the site from elsewhere to be used as a fuel. It spread across and merged with different materials, structures and places, while at the same time interacting with numerous human and non-human members of that thriving community. Dung was populated by innumerable generations of bacterium strains, which would have amounted to more than half the total dry matter of French dung. Like fungi, the colony steamed in thick, viscous, odorous matter, consisting of a mix of undigested food residues and cell material that had been metabolized and excreted by different animals at the site. In several open area pens, or less frequently, within buildings which might have hosted birthing or injured animals, animal hooves trampled and mixed dung with the rem remnant fodder into a hybrid food feces material. At Chatel Hoog, dung also burned steadily at high temperatures and often mixed with wood on fires in houses or in open areas in, in the yards. Dung acted in its ashy form either as a temper for construction materials such as mortar and mud bricks or as a sanitizer which, when scattered across open spaces, reduced strong odors and insect breeding. 
It was also spread on intensively cultivated garden plots as fertilizer to increase the crop yields of cereals and other plants such as barley, wheat, lentil and peas, which were a common staple at the site. In addition to being mundane, dung was inexorably vital in that it was not merely bound up with bodily processes and cross-species encounters, but co-constituted other materials, things, places and technologies, such as those related to fire, for example. Here I wish to suggest that these different processes and relations reveal a distinctive nature-culture dynamic at Chatel Hoog. More specifically, they indicate that dung was ontologically multiple. It acted as a heterogeneous material fabric which embodied human-animal, techno-political and socio-ecological relations. Focusing upon distinct flows of dung across the Tao settlement, and the various material discursive practices infused, sustained, vi vitalized or disrupted by it is a fruitful exercise which allows us to foreground a notion of a more fluid material emerging through a number of intersecting flows, including those of foodstuffs coming from different places and others of metabolized matter being excreted across different settlement areas. Dunk itself also moved from off to on site and from open areas in into houses and back again. These were all materials flows, transmutations of energy, shape and form, moving from food to animal body to dunk to human body. The material was in motion. What mattered during the early occupation of the East Mountain from 7000 to 6700 BC was the directness and immediacy of some of the flows. Geoarchaeological analysis of deposits from Space 199 and successive Space 198, as well as Space 620 and Space 630, have revealed that these were all panning enclosures, identified by their distinctive laminar microstructure and the presence of fodder and animal feces. Wendy Matthews describes Space 199-198 98 as a large walled animal pen that measured more than 9 meters by 5 meters and was rebuilt twice in the same place. She contends that the size of the pen and the intensity and duration of its use all indicate significant management of animal herds and their resources immediately prior to a phase of settlement expansion. Indeed, as argued by Matthews, Dung as a fuel might have been a significant factor in the emergence of intimate relationships between animals and humans. During the mid-7th millennium BC, when Chatel Huyg housed between 3,000 and 8,000 people, community cohesion might have experienced potential cracks associated with a peak in population growth, settlement density and physical stress and disease. This would have led to ritual and symbolic elaboration, including the highest number of burials beneath house floors and more animal part installations and reliefs on the walls. The tension was further relieved by changes in community structure and multiple innovations in resource use, which were, after 6500 BC, associated with an increase in flows and movement leading away from the site. People procured food further away, for example, whilst Caprine herds grazed over a wider range of environments. Significantly, after 6500 BC, the material flows of Dang at Chatel Huyg indicate that animals were corralled further away from the site. In contrast to the earlier period, greater quantities of Dang may have arrived from elsewhere, given that no in situ panning structures have as yet been documented for these occupational levels. Also, the amount of dung as a fuel decreased within middens that were in the later Neolithic sequence frequently formed through the interchanging rubbish discard and in situ burning events, which would have produced massive layers reaching up to 50 centimeters in thickness. A constant fixture in Chatel Huyk life, middens were spread across open areas between buildings and throughout the occupational sequence. The accumulating waste, an assemblage of massive quantities of wood ash, dung ash and grass ash, food discard, oven and hearth rakeout, floor sweepings, broken basketry and matting, crop processing and production discard, building debris and human and animal feces, meandered around large-scale groupings of houses and in doing so, separated these into social sectors. 
Unlike proto-urban and historical sanitation and waste management systems, systems with infrastructures in place to collect, sort and contain feces within inbuilt underground sewage channels, flows of human and animal waste at Chattel Huig continued above ground and across open area surfaces for some thousand years. Chattel Huig's middens were effectively places in where once mundane, discreet and durable things became something else. Incorporating huge amounts of ash and human animal feces, each medium was gradually transformed into a homogenous mass that no longer harkened back to its previous existence and instead acquired the anonymous general character of mass waste. Yet middens were also places that teemed with abundant life, not only in the form of microbiota decomposing the organic matter within, but also in the form of some minerals aging and others emerging, as evidenced, for example, by the large quantities of neoformed gypsum crystals in the areas of Kulsiti Cache. We should attend to another vital aspect of dung, its association with Chadalhuyuk agropastoral practices. Amy Bogard argues that the community at the size exercised integrated small-scale intensive agriculture and livestock herding. Land, land tenure was organized in a several household system with individual households making contrasting choices of which crops to sow with particular variations amongst gloom weeds and pulses around the mid-Neolithic sequence. The isotopic data for cereals and pulses indicates the use of dung as fertilizer, with manure being part of Chattelhuic taskscapes. As fertilizer, dung required labor time and attention. Collected from corrals close to the settlement, it would have been transported probably after allowing some time to age to the intensively cultivated garden plots where it would have been spread across steel soils. As different plants require different types and quantities of manure, crop selection would have also affected individual manuring strategies. These would have been further guided by hands-on knowledge of varied soils and their interaction with various crops within geomorphologically and ecologically diverse Karshamba alluvial plain. Together with animals, plants, people and land, flows of manure co-constituted the emerging, historically specific sense of place. Within this vibrant landscape, dung was contributing to the process of meaning, memory and history making. By working with animals, plants, soil and manure, people belong to the place and land. So, why does dung matter? I have dealt with dung at Chattel Huyk through recursive and loopy, looping accounts on animal waste as a flow, a process, a vitality and an interaction. These flows were spatially and temporally specific. Before 6500 BC, some were stronger, more direct and more immediate, as indicated by the presence of several animal enclosures on the site. In the later occupational phases, they shifted and changed. Dung was brought to the site and there was less of it. At Chattel Huyuk, dung was employed as a fuel burning on fires in open areas, yards and houses. Its presence in the material record points to different techniques and technologies that were shaped, enabled and constrained by it. On site, the material would have been enmeshed with food preparation and likely pottery production. Off site, it would have been employed as manure. In addition to being mundane, dung was animate in that it not only teemed with organic and inorganic life, but also co-constituted other materials, things, places and technologies. As fertilizer, for instance, it would have played a vital part in the historically specific process of meaning and memory making, along with the creation of a sense of belonging to place and land. Some 9000 years later, the flows of dung from livestock to crops have been mostly cut off. Crops are grown with industrial fertilizers, while animals slurry festers in large stinking lagoons. As one of the biggest sources of methane, it contributes to and accelerates global warming. When applied to the land, it threat threatens to exacerbate antibiotic resistance. This, then, is dung's responsibility to human action today. What will ours be? Thank you.